Black patriarch. I mean, after the allegations made against Harvey Weinstein, there was this cascade uh, of allegations and stories that came out about many men. Are you seeing that start to change things culturally when it comes to allegations made against black men by black women? I think we're starting to see a shift because I feel like black women are finally starting to feel like it's okay for them to tell their stories and to be honest about their victimization. But historically, that has not been the case. Should the teams that passed on Luca regret not drafting him, Janae? I don't think they should. And I know this makes you hurt, Ryan, because it hurts when you see a young player transition to the NBA so well. And you're a big, I'm a big. Uh, when you transition to the professional level, it's so much easier when you're a big because you're just around the basket, you're finishing, you're making screens, making cuts, just catch and finish. Representative Ilhan Omar, her story is one of tragedy and triumph. That story took her from a war-torn region in Somalia to a refugee camp and now the Minnesota State House of Representatives. It's a great opportunity for her, and uh, I'm very happy that you know she's in a black American, and uh, for the legislation to become represented in Minnesota. Mudar Kelly started in the summer of 2017 um, when the allegations came out about him having what the media were calling sex cults in his home here in Atlanta, um, and that kind of sparked me to do some research and see all of the things that he had been doing over the years since I was 15, 16 years old. Um, and it just enraged me. This morning, I interacted with educators, 400 of them, that the Congressional Black Caucus shares its knowledge and gives them an opportunity to collaborate around crucial issues of educating our children. George Romney was born in Mexico. You didn't have a sort of similar birth or movement around him. You had John McCain born in the Pan Panama Canal Zone. There were no questions raised. Birtherism, you know, which dates back to really as early as 2007 and people questioning whether Barack Obama was a secret Muslim, whether he was sn sneaked into the country essentially by his mother.
Good evening, this is T. West and welcome to Afro Synergy. Turning African Americans against Africans and African immigrants. Here in the United States, since the, especially, but this was happening before the Black Panther movie came out, but the Black Panther movie, movie gave some of you, it appears, a little bit more energy to actually do what you're doing, which is you're looking for ways to further divide blacks. But African Americans and Africans, African immigrants, continental Africans, they must work together. for everybody, uh, not regardless of race. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a class struggle, it's not an ethnic struggle. Although, you know, we do get a lot of the discrimination because the people are Mexican or black or Filipino or Arabian, but it's, uh, we don't discriminate amongst each other or we don't dislike people because they're white, you know. Mm -hmm. That is not the reason, it's a class struggle. It's the poor against the rich. These colleges, no colleges, no institutions in this country would consider the black Chicano, Asian, Indian perspectives, unless it was a political force. When it, <clears throat> the Chicano people constitute one of three internal nations, that uh, internal in the mother country and in imperialism, and uh, those nations are now engaged in a war of national liberation, um, the difference being that they are inside the mother country. The nation of Puerto Rico, which is uh, based in, in Puerto Rico and in New, in New York, uh, the black nation, the struggle of the black people in this country, and the Chicano Nation. We are right here having this interview in California. Baca is the author of The Presumed Alliance, which documents the tension between blacks and Hispanics. He says as the Hispanic population continues to grow, this battle is going to play out in other cities around the country. Latinos are going to exert their power. They're doing it in California in a significant way. Uh, African Americans are going to have to adjust to the fact that they are no longer the largest minority in the United States. African Americans are going to have to adjust to the fact that they are no longer the largest minority in the United States. One more statistic for you. The most recent Census Bureau estimates say that between 2010 and 2013, black immigrants accounted for 25% of the growth in America's overall black population. 25% of the growth in America's overall black population. All people of African descent are our people, and that we are all immigrants. But more importantly, in order for us to move forward, we must recognize that you are me and I am you. 
Um, when it comes to immigration history and status, that actually adds another layer of complexity and within the black community. The issue of immigration for African people starts with the Mahatma. So I think it's important to put it in the historical context. And uh, we often talk about black empowerment um, and we all have sort of our own definitions of it. So what I wanted to do since we have such a fabulous um, group of panelists with me uh, is for them to each talk about their individual perspectives on what black empowerment means. Gabriel Selassie here at Voice of America, where they just had a town hall discussing many important issues around the African diaspora. We need to be able to engage just like we had this town hall uh, meeting today. Dr. Mena Demise spoke out and encouraged the audience members to get out there and vote. Our presence and our purpose will help us identify our policy priorities. Leaders spoke out on unifying their efforts to make an impact. I think we'll be more effective if we are part of an African coalition. It's us coming together as Africans, as a continent, and as in our own different nations. The biggest theme echoed was unity. Unity is something all the leaders stressed on how the African diaspora needs to work together regardless of what country, religion, or area they are from on the continent. Welcome to Pick Yourself Up. I am Asa Gidhabtold, your host. Today, I have a very dynamic guest. I let her to talk about herself and encourage you to listen from her story, from her lessons, and so on and so forth. Uh, just sharing my fervent desire to eradicate racial disparities, to um, uh, think about ideas around citizenship and rights for immigrants to uh, lift up the Ethiopian American diaspora, the African diaspora, um, in the context of the American polity around issues that we care about. Barack is the President of the United States of America. We have to understand what Barack says he believes. So we can't get angry at him, Dr. Mavo, when he says the rising tide would lift our boat, because that's where he was raised. That's not to put anything on him. The descendants of enslaved Africans in America have a different experience. First of all, we're the only group of people in this country that did not voluntarily come here. We are forced immigrants. We're also the only group of people in this country that the American government made laws against to keep in bondage. America, one thing about America, they love to talk about stuff. They said, let's talk about it. You talk about it, you get it out, you get it out. But when it comes to the black, enslaved and black people, they say, shut up, be quiet, don't talk about it, because blacks, we are America's dirty little secret, as, as Dr. Claude Anderson said. And America don't want to deal with the whole question of reparation, repair, and the damage.
DOS term is a very good term. I actually like that. Descendants of slaves or descendants of slavery. Very good term. Now, I like that term. See, so you have the folks who talk, who say, oh, hashtag DOS, descendants of slaves. And they start going on and on and on and on about, oh, uh, uh, she don't have a DOS agenda. And, okay, but here's the piece. Who is going to ask the question? For example, right now, from the Black Identity Framework, there's a new sort of uh, hashtag and or uh, identity that's in their bios called ADOS or DOS, which is standing for Descendants of Slaves. So it's the indication that they are op they are someone who was born in, uh, you know, as, as a descendant in the United States who is representing Black America. What is that casting thing where you get the, the British black actor versus the American black actor to play the black? What is that? They come here because, you know, there are more opportunities and they actually get paid when they work here. You know, they make more money in this country than they do in that country, which is fine. You know, everybody needs to work, but there's a lot of brothers here that need to work, too. There's a lot of brothers here that need to work, too. Nigerian or every African you see excelling, there was no road paid for them. There was no road paid for them. You know, a lot of them are first generations or second generations. So it's, you just saw your parents work so hard and just doing what they know to do. And now you, they're exposed to all these opportunities. They're exposed to all these opportunities, all these opportunities. So whenever I see, you know, another African, especially, I'm just like, you better do it. Yes, put those on the map. Recently, you opened up for Chris Rock. Yeah. How was that? Dude, it was amazing. It was in Atlanta, Memorial mm -hmm. Day weekend. Chris is such a legend. He's so good at what he does. And so it was a, an honor just even to get that spot and just even to get that location. That was just like prime. It was like mm -hmm. prime real estate. And then I got off the stage, and he's there with his arms folded. And he's like, you're good. You got good stuff. And I was like, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rock. really look down on black American people? No, I think Africans, I would say specifically for Nigerians, Nigerians are proud for people. We look down on other Nigerians. So it's not you. even, and it's not even that we're looking down. We're just always looking up. Another thing before I, before I get off, man, you you 110% right about Africans, bro. Mm. 110%. My mom is from Nigeria. My mm. father's from Liberia. Tariq, mm. you are Hundred and ten percent right about Africans, bro. Mm, mm. My entire life, man, my family used the word Akata like it was nothing. Mm, my yeah. mom used it, my uncles yeah. use it, cousins use it. They all have their ideology that they are totally different from black Americans. Yeah. I put my family on that, man. My wife is an American. When I first met my wife, my mom's didn't want me to marry my wife, to me. Mm, she mm. told me, you got you growing a cot out here. Don't bring no cot out here.
sophomore season of Snowfall continues the fascinating story of the rise of the crack cocaine epidemic and its huge impact on culture. I think it speaks closely to a lot of things that are happening today, you know, particularly with the opioid crisis which is going on right now, which is seen as a health crisis, you know. Do you still live in England? Yeah, yeah, I still live in, um, I grew up in Peckham, Southeast London. Welcome to Los Angeles, as yeah. we call it here. I'm yeah, and but it's amazing the accent that you do on the show because you really seem like you're an American. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, uh, well, that was the object, I guess, that was yeah. your intention. How did you do that so well? Wow, so um, I have um, a dialect coach, his name's Dub C. Okay. And he's from um, Westside Connection. He raps with... Oh, the rapper. Ice okay. Cream. Yeah, real uh -huh. OG. Okay. And it was amazing. <laughs> That's your dialect coach? I know, right? So you could, <laughs> you could understand I was petrified all the time. <laughs> so I was staying downtown where they put me, uh -huh. and he called me up, and he was like, yeah, what's up? It's Dub C. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be your dialect coach. They want to call me a damn dialect coach. He did a good job, I yeah, guess. Yeah, he did transitioned he... me from a British wimp to an American gangster. Hello and welcome to The Grapevine. I'm your host, Ashley Acuna. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about black British actors coming to the U.S. to make careers in Hollywood. But before we get into it, let me introduce you to my London panel. Give yourselves a round of applause. Okay. Right. Hey. So we did an episode before about this topic when Samuel L. Jackson said something about Daniel Kaluuya you know, being in Get Out and black British actors coming to the U.S. And we had a mostly, you know, African-American, American panel. So I thought it would only be fair if I come to <laughs> London. Because so many people talk about this and we don't really hear the black British perspective. What do you guys think about the fact that black actors are coming from, you know, the U.K. to L.A. to make careers? And what do you think about the backlash from, like, African-Americans, black Americans? I'd love to start. Go ahead, start. <laughs> so I, I, I understand the complaints of African-Americans, especially when it comes to rep representing this story with nuance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because you are black doesn't mean you're interchangeable with someone else's culture. And the way we consume African-American culture with that hyper-visibility makes us feel that we can represent their story in, you know, with 100% accuracy. When that's not necessarily true, African-Americans are different depending on where you come from. You could be Creole, you could be from New York, those kind of things. However, <laughs> African Americans historically have come over to the UK and acted in um, movies, on plays, here in the UK. Mm -hmm. and. It's very, very telling the fact that black British actors were not used and only African-American actors were used and specifically for black British roles. It's more logical in our perspective, from my perspective, because Hollywood is the epicenter mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. acting. Mm -hmm. So where else are we supposed to go? Why the hell would we stay here? Mm -hmm. Surely we, I'm not saying that it's better over in America because I know that there are um, tensions there. Yes, yeah. Yeah. but the fact is I have more of a chance and that's all I need, I yeah. just yeah. want a chance. Yeah. about you know some African Americans who feel like 
you know, if it's a story like uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor mm. in Twelve mm. Years a Slave, mm. or Selma with the uh, yeah. yeah, and how it should be someone of who who has descended from slavery right. to yeah. make those. Yeah. 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 And if the person That's is good right. enough for the role, yeah. Yeah. then why are we worrying about where the person how comes from? Yeah, why people yeah. don't have to be yeah. Yeah. like But do you but do you think that there's certain experiences that they bring to the? right about you. Don't be so sure. Tiffany's always right. People objected to the casting of Forrest Whitaker, an American, because there are so few parts for British black actors, but for me there was no other choice. He immersed himself in the role of the English squaddy, including the London accent, even if he didn't lose quite enough weight. Say okay, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. how I feel. Not to how I feel. Not to how I feel. What do people say? We fought for our rights here in the U.S. So okay. You know, like, now you guys have to fight what for yours. You but I can say without question. Nobody wants the wall built more than Ann Coulter. Guys, give it up for Ann Coulter. <laughs> worth pointing out that immigrants are piggybacking on the black experience in America. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say this to the Hispanics in the audience, but I'm sorry you're going to have to throw in your lot with, you know, the Asians and the whites. We didn't descend from slaves. We don't get special benefits. This is the logical, normal, obvious point, and therefore it is the Republican position. Um, <laughs> the whole reason this country is sensitive to racial issues is because for about 200 years, African Americans got the short end of the stick. There was slavery. There was Jim Crow. And then we had the civil rights laws saying, okay, that's it. We're, we owe them. We're going to spend it all on them. Now suddenly, you know, an immigrant who arrived Friday is demanding special benefits. No, no. No, what did we do to you? <laughs> Black people outside of America are resentful or angry that African Americans have that hyper visibility because that's usually. That's usually. Wait, let me just let me just say why I ask because that's usually the narrative that a lot of people try to use.
let's take it to university and how, you know, there's been some studies done that say most black people who go to Ivy Leagues are actually Africans and not African Americans. Is that a situation where we're taking opportunities from African Americans? Mm -hmm. Do Africans deserve to benefit off of um, affirmative action? Absolutely. Because I suffered too. Because I suffered too. Because I suffered too. They can't discern if you are African or if you are African American. At the end of the day, they are discriminating against you for your color. You're gonna have a massive influx of immigrants into the country. What we've allowed them to do starting in 1970 is to wrap themselves in black folks suffering and pretend somehow they've suffered along with black folk. I think it's important to understand that though as African American people, we are all presently black people in America. Mm -hmm. That is our current shared experience. That's what's happening now. So whether or not a person in a position of privilege is African or African American, that's still visibility, which is something that we need to fight for as black people. Affirmative action. Like she said, we're talking about identities, right? So what is African American enough? get it. And I think that we go into murky waters when we say, oh, okay, Africans cannot benefit from this. First of all, in this country, I'm, I identify as black. There's no separate calling for me to identify as African. Mm -hmm. And when they see me, I go through, whether you like it or not, I go through the black experience, the black struggles, the positive and the negative. I go through that, right? Mm -hmm. Hollywood where African Americans have played Africans. It's like people allowed you to do it and they didn't complain. So well, like, so I brought that up on Twitter <laughs> and somebody said Africans do complain. And I tried to I, I, I tried to say you, I tried to say, okay, Africans in Africa are not complaining because they have other issues they to worry about. Issues. It's us who are here yes. who will complain, but even when we complain, it's not to the extent of get them out of here, they're taking our roles. It's not, I feel like it's not that like, just do it better. We'll, yeah, we'll right. laugh and then we'll like be like, hey, they could have gotten someone else, but it won't, I feel like the intensity is different. I do think though, I'm going to say, I'm going to add one caveat. There mm -hmm. is very much an imbalance of power. There is very much the idea that if you're African and you say something about African Americans that have, you know, crossed a certain threshold, you'll be gobbled up way much, way much more intensely and with more animosity than if it's in the other way around. talk about the whole Beyonce slash Sarah Bartman controversy. So what happened is that the other day, um, it was announced that Beyonce was slated to play Sarah Bartman. And for those of you who don't know who Sarah Bartman is, she was a woman who was enslaved and bought over to France and all through uh, Europe um, because she had an exceptionally large butt. She came from a tribe in South Africa. But where the controversy comes in is that the other day was announced that Beyonce was slated to play Sarah Bartman. So when folks heard this, people started going off on social media. People were going off on Instagram and on Twitter and saying that Beyonce has no business playing this role. A lot of South Africans were mad. A woman named Jean Burgess, who is from Sarah Bartman's tribe, also stated this comment. I'm gonna go ahead and read to you guys what Jean had to say about Beyonce. She says that Beyonce lacks the human dignity to be worthy of writing Sarah's story, let alone playing the part of Sarah Bartman. Now, do I feel like Beyonce would have been the right cast for Sarah Bartman? Of course not. She's not shaped like Sarah Bartman, and why not cast people from Sarah Bartman's tribe as opposed to casting an African American who has nothing to do with that culture? You know, that doesn't make any sense. I never understood why people bought into it in the first place. To me, it just didn't make any sense. Over the weekend,
weekend, Beyonce and Jay-Z, along with their closest friends and family, gathered for the Carter Push Party. But not everybody was a fan of Beyonce's generally African-themed get-together. South African artist, AKA, tweeted out, For all this Africa-themed baby stuff, Beyonce seems pretty reluctant to come here. Stinks of cultural appropriation. Others chimed in with fitness trainer Kalechi Okafor tweeting, African-themed party. Maybe today isn't the day for me to talk about the homogenizing of African cultures by your face. So did Beyonce miss the mark and appropriate culture? Or was this an appropriate nod to African roots? There can also be a reluctance to identify as African-American because of negative stereotypes of U.S.-born blacks, says Wayne Fairweather, a Jamaican-American who immigrated as a teen. In a country run by people of color, Fairweather says there were no negative depictions of black citizens manufactured by those in power. So when he was exposed to stereotypes of U.S.-born blacks, he tended to believe them. When you grow up in another country, you think the streets in America are literally paved in gold, Fairweather says. You think that all you have to do is work hard and that African Americans have succeeded because they are lazy. They call you the king of Afro beats right now. <laughs> Is that what they call you? I mean, I mean, people do. Now, where are you from? Um, I'm from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mainly from Nigeria, but I was born in the States. So you was born here? I was born in Atlanta. Born in Atlanta, got, got your birth certificate from here. Yeah, got mm -hmm. the passport. Got, got the passport, there. right. So now you're good. Come yeah. Come on. You have to have another country or in black people's uh, uh, circumstance and Latinos as well, there's actually entire continents mm -hmm. that you have at your disposal. What am I doing? Hey guys, thank you for joining me today on Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree. A few people asked me to talk about this topic. I actually wasn't that interested in making a video on it. It was about a black student union at Cornell who were demanding, made demands to their administration. One of them including that the admissions department focus on recruiting more native black Americans because there were too many African and Caribbean immigrants that were included as part of the black population and being recruited. So this is a topic that I think that I am pretty well versed in because I am a foreigner and I am a Caribbean immigrant and I came to the United States through college. When I came to this country, everybody is foreign to me. That is, everybody has a different culture from me that is including um, black Americans. And it's very weird that people just think that you automatically share similarities with them just because of the skin color. The only thing I would say is that there's some like shared music, maybe, but that's nothing. <laughs> it's very, very minor. Like I have more in common with an Indian Jamaican than a black American. Like everything more in common because we actually grew up in the same culture like i have more in common with an indian jamaican than a black american like 
everything more in common because we actually grew up in the same culture one more thing i wanted to say that i think other caribbean communities do have similar issues in terms of the ones that a lot of people talk about when they talk about the black american community however they don't complain in the same way and they don't outsource and externalize their problems and i think that's a pretty major difference they were even trying to distinguish between black americans and foreign blacks because foreign blacks haven't experienced white supremacy in this country even though they're always going on about how if you have black skin x y and z happens to you and you're automatically a victim and afforded victim status but now again because they're not getting what they want because this is really about advantage in an underhanded way instead of actually trying to get the skills that they need to compete they're trying to get it through claiming injustice all this means is that they want to indoctrinate you and tell you what to think based on their worldview and they pick the people who get to do it this is just garbage this stuff is just this is garbage this is absolute garbage Black Patriarch.